Later in her play, Heidi shares the following. I told my mom about my abortion recently because, well, I had to because I was going to tell all of you. She was so blasé about it. I was like, why did you freak out then? She said, I could be calm about it now that I know your life turned out okay. She wanted to know if I was angry with her, and I was like, no, because my life turned out okay. Heidi continues, I think there were two mothers in the car with me that day. There's the first mother, who was the feminist, who made me do this contest so I could go to college and end with who ended the legacy of violent men in our family by testifying against her stepfather at 15. And then there's the second mother, the mother who'd been terrorized as a child, the mother whose first memory at age three was seeing her stepfather punch her mother and thinking, oh no, this is what life is like. The mother who'd inherited centuries of belief in her own worthlessness. No, not just belief. Centuries of laws that explicitly told her she was worthless. Centuries of laws that explicitly told her she was worthless. If you have not seen this play, I highly recommend it. You can find it online. So why are we discussing the right for reproductive freedom in 2023? Because there have been and continue to be centuries of laws that explicitly tell women they are worthless and they do not have the right to decide what happens to their bodies. This is true for all who identify as a woman, whether they were designated as a female at birth or not, as well as those who are gender diverse. These laws and societal systems get even more restrictive if you add race to the equation. When race is added, then we have to consider the centuries of medical experiments and breeding done to the people of color in our society and the impact they have had on generations of women of color. Did you know that according to the Center for Disease Control, in 2021, the maternal mortality rate for black women was 69.9 deaths per 100,000 live births. 2.6 times the rate for white women. The CDC also reported the increases from 2020 to, 2020 to 2021 for all race and Hispanic origin groups were significant. Many of these deaths were preventable. However, because of the racial bias built into our healthcare system, black mothers who were suffering from high blood pressure were being sent home instead of being taken seriously. Black mothers who were feeling pain or discomfort were ignored and told they were fine. Black mothers' experiences were not valued or heard. In the resolution the congregation will be voting on during the annual meeting on June 4th, you are not only being asked to affirm the reproductive rights and the moral choices of whether or not to have children, you are also vowing, and this is a direct quote from the resolution, to work against anything which constrains reproductive rights, especially when the target is women, queer people, gender diverse people, people with disabilities, immigrants, indigenous populations, and people of color. To work against anything that constraints reproductive rights. This means removing the shame and judgment and stigma, stigma from any and all choices a woman can make about her reproductive journey. We need to understand all reproductive choices, whether to have children or not, or to end a pregnancy can be equally moral. I recently learned through our Unitarian Universalist Association Side with Love campaign about the history of our clergy consultation service. The network was created the year after the Griswold case, which is what you heard a little bit of the mm, uh, uh, <coughs> about, that determined the legality of birth control for married women. It started because women were approaching their ministers and rabbis for help and all the clergy members could offer was comfort or reassurance. They found it unacceptable that they did not have practical solutions for, women, for the women they met. 
Therefore, they came together as an ecumenical group, consulted with the ACLU, trained in direct action tactics, interviewed and vetted doctors who provided abortions, actually had women that would go in and, and act like they were pregnant and, and make sure that the doctors were okay. And they launched the clergy consultation service. To launch the program, they had an article on the front page of the New York Times which listed 21 clergy willing to help with their names and phone numbers listed. They intentionally put the word abortion in the title of the article to help destigmatize and alleviate the shame. Not only that, they were fighting to ensure that it was affordable and accessible. They wanted to sacralize the choice for abortion. They unabashedly shared the good news of the work they were providing. They took out ads in the white pages and yellow pages using abortion services, so it was at the front page. The CCS started in 1966, and by 1972, they had 609 locations around North America. There were over 2,000 clergy involved. 40 states were activated. There were even some in Canada and between a quarter and a half million women were helped. They reduced the cost of abortion from $500, between the range of $500 and $1,000, which at that time was around the 10,000 to 15,000 range, to $25 or $125. They ensured safe travel across state or country borders, because there was uh, travel between uh, the US and Canada. And once Roe versus Wade was passed, they helped build the inf infrastructure of clinics across the country. The clergy involved felt it was their calling to ensure women had the choice and decide what they wanted to do with their bodies and to break down the barriers that would interfere with any choice they made. I'm happy to report that many of the clergy involved were Unitarian Universalists. In addition, the Unitarian Universalist Association in 1963 issued the first and most progressive statement on abortion. It stated that the Unitarian Universalist Association support enactment of a uniform statute making abortion legal if, one, there would be grave impairment of the physical or mental health of the mother, most agreed on that, two, the child would be born with a serious physical or mental de deficit, that was agreed upon, three, pregnancy resulted from rape or incest, that was generally agreed upon. And four, there exists some other compelling reason, physical, psychological, mental, spiritual, or economic. That was not universal. That was the most progressive statement. It is this fourth line that calls for complete trust and affirmation in the decision being made by the woman involved. We have a history of removing shame, judgment, and stigma from a, rights, from a woman's right to choose. We have done this through declaring support publicly, creating networks of support, and placing trust in a woman's ability to make that decision. We are called by this resolution to continue the work of our history and step into public places to show our support, to partner with others, doing this work and to build trust and worth in women's voices and experiences. Another way we are called to work against any constraints to reproductive rights is to support the work of parenting and healthy growth of children in safe, sustainable, nurturing communities. We again have history in this congregation of ways we have done this well. In 2001, members of this congregation created the organization Up on Top to provide no-cost childcare options to families impacted by changes in the federal wel welfare program. This program still exists today and provides high-quality tuition-free after-school and summer pro programs to low-income families in San Francisco. You did this. You have this history. You have supported families. Our families and children in the San Francisco Bay Area are hurting right now. Many are still in shell shock from the effects of the pandemic. We have a huge mental health crisis happening amongst our young people. When my oldest child, who will be 24 in June, 
was a teenager, we were talking about the rising suicide rates in teens. Most recently, I read an article where the suicide rates are rising in children as young as eight years old. We have a problem. We have families struggling with food and housing insecurity, families that are facing the rising costs of childcare, families who are impacted by the recent bank closures. By fully supporting all choices, we are called not just to work and make birth control, abortion, adoption accessible, we are also called to take care of those who have decided to create families in whatever form they decide. This means finding ways to increase our budget in our, for child care and family events to support our parents and caregivers, increase within our congregation connections with all ages, to fight for food and housing security within our city, to create more accessible quality child care, and to build supportive communities. And finally, to create opportunities for accessible mental health services and support our children and families. Let's not isolate our families, but find ways to create an inclusive community with them. One more way we can work against any constraints to reproductive rights is to advocate for equitable access to the full spectrum of comprehensive reproductive health care. I don't know if any of you have tried to work our health system and work with insurance lately. Yeah. If you have, then you know the barriers the insurance companies create to comprehensive care. You know the difficulty in trying to schedule an appointment with any specialist in a reasonable time frame. You know how, our over, how overcrowded our emergency rooms are. You know the countless hurdles just to gain access, not to even just see the, not to get into the door, just to get access to it. And I'm going to take a big leap here and say the vast majority of us in this room have the privilege of being able to access health care and insurance. And even with that privilege, the barriers are exhaustive. One way we can advocate for this equitable access is to take on the insurance companies and get the healthcare systems to reduce, reduce their complexity. That's a pretty big ask, and I'm not discounting our ability to do it. However, I wonder if there's some other ways to tackle this issue. In the previous congregation I served in Wenatchee, we had the privilege of a parish nurse. This was a retired nurse who provided all kinds of resources and support to our congregants and the most valuable support she provided was being an advocate for our congregants. She helped them navigate the health and insurance system. She helped them determine where to find resources and how to ask questions to get results. And here at UUSF, we also have a great team of people in our lay chaplains of retired nurses and social workers who provide this advocacy for our congregants. I wonder, however, if there's an organization we can partner with in the local area that we can be trained to help provide this advocacy to those beyond our walls. The skills you need, as you know, if you've worked the healthcare system, is persistence and patience to keep asking the questions until you get the answers or get an appointment. And get an appointment. I think we can be pretty patient and persistent. I invite you to return to the story we had earlier of daughter Goose, who was faced with a difficult decision when Mr. Fox said he picked up a white and black stone only to pick up two black stones. Instead of being overwhelmed and stuck in trying to decide what to do, daughter Goose used strategic creativity to solve her problem. When we are faced by these daunting issues, we need to harness our strategic creativity. We strategically need to find ways to partner with others in this work and bolster their efforts. We need to remember who we're fighting for and the privilege we carry in being able to decide to fight or not. We need to remember the people of color and the barriers they face. We need to remember the families and children who need our support. We need to create room for the worth and dignity of all experiences and choices in reproductive freedom to be honored. I want to end by telling you of a legal case that is currently happening in the state of Missouri that involves two of our UU clergy 
Reverend Molly Hosh Gordon and Reverend Krista Taves, along with 11 other Missouri clergy. They are talking, tackling the issue of access to abortion in a unique way. Typically, the legal cases involve individual people and their right. In this case, Black Men versus Missouri, the case is arguing that the current state ban on abortion violates the Missouri Establishment Clause, which guarantees the separation of church and state. They are stating their case in two ways. One, all clergy involved are saying their faith responds and requires women to have a choice in their reproductive rights. And two, the current ban is based on a faith belief of the current state governor and legislators, which is not theirs. If this case is won, it would overturn all bans in the state of Missouri. The clergy are being vocal about their faith and their affirmation of the choice and reproductive rights, and they are using the public square to their advantage. When faced with an impossible situation, they found creative and strategic ways to respond and partnered with others to get it done. Why are we talking about this on Mother's Day in 2023? Because all who have decided to become mothers, all who have made a choice to not be a mother, all who have decided to end a pregnancy, all who have died during pregnancy, all who have struggled to keep their children alive, all who participate in reproduction are affected by this. And we affirm in our principles, we are all interconnected in the interdependent web of life. This means we are all responsible in ensuring reproductive justice is a priority so we can continue to celebrate the spectrum of mothering in years to come. When you're deciding your vote for the resolution at the annual meeting on June 4th, I hope you remember what we're trying to achieve and vote to support it not only in your yes, but also in your actions. May it be so.